All right, so um, I'm Andrew Rogers. Most of the time I don't get up here, or if I do, it's just to say something quick and pithy and, and move on. Um, I'm up here today because I want to talk a little bit about the Edney building that we're in right now and the fact we're moving here and that we've got this great community space with much improved uh, AV equipment, uh, live streaming equipment. Um, the live stream quality should go up quite a bit. We're doing a lot of, a lot of work, new cameras, new, 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 new stuff. So um, the Edney Innovation Center, which is the building you're in, is the considered the anchor building for the Innovation District. And um, this space is available for what we consider innovation-related, mission-related events, um, and the community space out there as well. Um, if you want to rent it for something private, that's fine too. That's a, you know, we'll talk about that. But anyway, uh, due to that, Chadevs is able to meet here and it's considered part of the innovation um, initiative and, and, and it's, it's being donated to us basically from the Enterprise Center slash, which is in turn the city and county. So uh, very great to have their support now. Um, yes, sir. Um, pretty much anything related to innovation. I think most of the meetups under the Chadev umbrella, so um, uh, Chadev DevOps, uh, the Python meetup, they'll be meeting here. Um, I think you have a couple of meetups we would love to, to see here. Um, so yeah, I think it's pretty, pretty open. Um, so I just want to say a little word about that. This is floor five, um, collabs on the ground floor, and I think we'll see over the next uh, three to six months, we'll see more and more companies moving into the, to the, to the building, so that we'll have a kind of really cool group of folks here. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brett now to introduce the speaker um, and talk, give the, the normal intro, but I just want to throw a little information out about the building. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. There's a lot of new faces here, so great to see you all. is, like what all this is about, who knows what it's about? Raise your hand really high, really high. You know exactly what an innovation district is. All right. Yeah, it's the painted thing out here. Andrew, <laughs> Andrew, come back up here and please tell people what the Sorry innovation about that. district yeah, is. So, so an innovation district loosely um, is where you, it's, it's kind of a development strategy where you're intentionally densifying an urban environment with innovative companies. Um, a lot of times they get sector aligned, so you'll have a biotech kind of innovation district or an advanced manufacturing innovation district. Um, we're trying to be a little more general here. Um, I think the software and I think the entrepreneurial ecosystem is what really is, is, is our kind of binding glue for what we're doing in Chattanooga. Um, and that hopefully actually gets to be a broader thing rather than a, you know just software or just this or that, just logistics. So um, I, th I think that, that that's, that's really the definition. And the idea is that if you have multiple companies working in close proximity, um, especially if they're working on disparate things, and you get them meeting in coffee shops, you get the engineers socializing at meetups like this, um, you get a, 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 the, the sum of the innovation coming out of that economy is greater than the part of uh, the parts. So that's kind of the the whole, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, that's what I meant to say. Anyway, that's kind of the, really loosely the definition of innovation district. So, and All here right. it means a five minute walking distance from essentially Miller Plaza. And so we're not quite in the center of it here, but this is really the, um, kind of the, the community uh, catalyst <laughs> building for, for the Innovation District. And, and an interesting thing, a thing of note is that Innovation Districts are typically associated with research institutions or universities. Um, and so Chattanooga is kind of paving some new ground here on, hey, we've got this great entrepreneurial ecosystem. How can we leverage that and, and, and really make the most of it? And so this is kind of a, we're doing a lot of first mover things with this. So anyway. All right. Um, okay, so we're, we have a uh, human motion controller. I don't have a clicker, so we're going to see how well this works. 
to advance the slides. Is it working? Uh. Oh, wait, you're right. There we go. All right. So uh, talk about some of our partners here today that uh, sponsor us and uh, make it possible for us to provide you with uh, free pizza every week. Open Table is one of them. Swipe. There we go. <laughs> uh, Lamp Post Group, Carbon 5, EPB, Colab, Society of Work, University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, all of these are, are great sponsors. And uh, you can thank them for keeping your bellies full on Thursday afternoon with us. Next. <clears throat> um, let's, uh, hey, actually hit refresh on that slide. This is last week's. We love Carbon 5. Get your phones out and give a shout out to Carbon 5. Oh yeah, I changed the slide order too. So if you want these slides, uh, all the links here are clickable. That's why you'd want to get on them, to click some of the interesting links that we have. And next. There we go. Give a shout out to EPB Chattanooga today. Um, this is our suggested content. Not a shootout. Not a shootout. <laughs> Uh, maybe uh, leave, leave the extra O. <laughs> uh, no shootouts, guys, really. Uh, um, yeah. Somebody shoot a picture of that. This is being live streamed, and it will forever live on the Internet. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Next. There we go. It's working. Um, hit us up on social media. <clears throat> um, Andrew, who just spoke. Uh, is running a series on Instagram called Humans of Chadev. So uh, get on there to learn some new stuff about your, your colleagues and peers. Um, of course, we're on Twitter and Meetup. If you didn't register today on Meetup, that's uh, our typical platform that uh, we use to get a count every week uh, for the pizza. So if you didn't RSVP today, try to do that in the future. Um, live streams, that link there is good. You can click on that. Uh, Pass it around to your friends if they can't be here. Next. Swipe. Boom. These are all the meetups. A lot of them will be meeting here, probably all of them. Um, if you don't see something that interests you here, come talk to us. We can help you start something. Wow. Chadev survey, Jared. Jared? Um, let's get a mic here. Oh, it was on? My bad. Here we go. That's fun. Um, step over there. There you go. Hey, guys. Um, here to talk about the Chadov survey. Uh, so you can go to that link, look at the survey, and take it. Uh, we're asking you some questions about your compensation package and your just general work-life balance. Um, Current job. Uh, we have about 29 people that have filled this out so far. We're looking for about 50 or more uh, to get a good <coughs> critical mass for a uh, good solid data set. Um, so it's kind of about uh, just adding, it's creating some transparency in the community and kind of giving you some context for your career to kind of know where you're at and uh, what sort of potential you have, uh, or what sort of potential you're capable of unlocking. Uh, based on what other people have accomplished around you. So um, take it. Uh, once you have enough data, I will create a report and share that with you guys. Uh, I want to keep the data anonymous as possible. So the goal is not to figure out who you are and either be envious of you or make fun <laughs> of you. Uh, the goal is to work together <laughs> and uh, make this community a better place. All right, sweet. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jerry. Hit us up on Slack. We're living on there now. We're living on Slack. So uh, you can join up here at this link, chadev slash slack in, uh, and then that's our uh, chadev work there. Uh, next. Uh, we're also on Freenode. Hit us up on there if you're more of an IRC person. Um, job board. Um, we have jobs on there. Check it out if you're looking for them. You might find one. 
Um, all right, so we're, we're running a little bit uh, later than we normally do. So at about 12.50, um, some of you may have to get back to work. Please feel free to do so. Um, Josh might run a little bit long, and in which case, uh, you're obviously, you're free to, to go without any sort of embarrassment. Um, and uh, we'll probably break at about, uh, well, whenever you finish, and, and then we'll have some time for questions and a uh, answers. Uh, for those of you that can stick around, uh, I've known Josh for, I don't know, quite a while now, it seems. Only a year and a half or so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, He's a, a great guy, and he uh, most recently uh, was a part of uh, Ambition, and uh, moving on to other things now. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's give uh, Josh a round of applause. <clears throat> Hello. Oh. Testing? Okay, cool. I've always wanted to say that. So, uh, I'm going to be talking about OCaml here, which is currently my favorite uh, programming language. That being said, a few disclaimers. I'm a novice at OCaml, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. And if you know for a fact I'm saying something wrong, or even suspect it, feel free to point it out. I'm still learning, so I'd be happy for the feedback. Also, I'm a novice at functional programming. All of this is like just hobbyist stuff for me. I'm generally a Python programmer by day, uh, anything else by night just mix it up. Also novice at giving talks, so um, yeah. So a couple of assumptions I'm making here. I'm assuming that everybody here has some programming experience, but not, not necessarily functional programming experience. Uh, so you know, I'm gonna try and like give gentle introductions to what I think are the core ideas behind some topics, uh, but also maybe try and throw out some things for people who might already know some stuff about that. Um, so yes. So what to expect in this talk is, you know, as an overview, I'm going to give a, a bit of a brief history of OCaml, what it is, uh, and uh, who uses it. A few notes on what I think are the core ideas of functional programming. Uh, contrast object-oriented programming with functional programming on a, on a very small scale with some contrived examples. Uh, and then contrast some Python and OCaml code. And just talk about the general OCaml features and overall ecosystem. I'm not gonna get to all the OCaml features in part because I haven't explored all of them, but just the ones that I've found like very useful and easy to jump into, uh, more or less from day one. So first of all, what is OCaml? It's a functional programming language, but still allows imperative constructs. So, you know, uh, some of you may have played with or heard much about Haskell, which is very pure, it takes things to uh, pretty much the logical extreme of functional programming as we currently understand it. Um, but uh, with OCaml, you can still do things like just throw in a print statement here or there, which I confess is still my preferred debugging method. It also has something called type inference, which is, which is pretty nifty, uh, and I'll get to that in a little bit. It has something called algebraic data types, which is not nearly as scary as the name would suggest. Uh, it sounds very academic-y, but it's, it's, very, it's very easy to use, very, uh, very nice. Garbage collection, which, you know, most things are nowadays. And it's also actually very fast. And I don't actually have much hard numbers on that, but I can point you to some, like, um, you know, speed uh, comparisons of, say, some code in Python versus OCaml, for instance. So, you know, who uses OCaml? OCaml is not a language you tend to hear about a lot. At least I didn't until recently. But it's got, you know, a fairly, you know, it's got some, you know, a lot of people, a few people use it. Uh, Jane Street Capital is an automated trading company. They're probably the most prominent since they do a lot of their stuff in OCaml and they open source a lot of the libraries to just, you know, build up the ecosystem, make it more usable, and that sort of thing. Also, Facebook uses it some internally. Facebook has uh, an internally a, uh, uh, a compiler for a variant of PHP called Hack, and the compiler is written in OCaml. And also Rust, which some of you may have heard about, uh, the initial compiler was written in OCaml too. Uh, and I found a uh, blog post, well not a blog post, um, an email, um, in a, an email thread talking about why OCaml is good for compiler design. Um, and you know, some, and a lot of it seems to boil down to the algebraic data types. It's just convenient to express certain things 
uh, in language design in that type of format. Um, let's see, moving on. So where did OCaml, OCaml come from? It's, it's an interesting history, uh, and he, here's the highlights, which is it, uh, originally there was a language in the 70s called ML, then somebody created a variation called Camel, and then somebody added object orientation to Camel and created OCaml. So, you know, that's been over the, about over the last um, 40 years, I guess, wow. We're getting into the century, aren't we? Um, See, there's some other related languages. Haskell is a close cousin of OCaml. Um, standard ML is a variation of ML, which is standardized. Um, and then, of course, there's F Sharp, which is Microsoft's version of uh, OCaml, sort of, that runs on the .NET runtime. I've not played with it, but it sounds pretty nifty from what I've heard. And I want to. So that's an overview, and I want to jump into some of the core concepts, which is what is functional programming? That's a term we've all heard a lot, most likely, in various blog posts and things like that. And uh, the core idea, in my opinion, is that uh, functional programming is about writing functions that always behave the same way. So, you know, you call a function, you pass it in arguments, and it will behave exactly the same way. It'll return the same value uh, every time you call it with that same set of arguments. And when a function does that, it's called a pure function. So uh, we might phrase it as f of f, oh. no. f of f, uh, f of x equals f of x every time. <coughs> okay, so now the next question is, what is functional programming? You know, because that's a, that's a high level definition. But first of all, let's talk about state. State is whatever information is in your program that affects how the code itself behaves. So, you know, uh, any variables your code may reference when making some, you know, some, making some uh, condition, some, checking some condition before branching, or something like that. And imp next important thing is, to think about is mutation. So mutation is a change to the state. So, you know, your code's churning along, it's doing its thing, looking at the state, and, and behaving. But then if the state changes, that now changes the behavior of the code. So those are sort of like two key ideas in understanding functional programming. So now I'm going to give some examples, which um, I tried to do this in pseudocode, but my pseudocode always turns into Python code. So I, I hope that's not too, uh, too uh, I hope the ideas are language agnostic enough that it's not, uh, I'm not singling out any, or excluding anybody. Um, let's see, so here's a simple example of some program. Suppose we've got some number, a value, and we want to be able to grab that value and update that value and keep track of how many times we've grabbed or updated the value. And we'll store that in the counter here. Well, here's you know, one way we might do that. We've got a little get value function that just always returns the, va the, the value and updates the counter. Got an update value function that changes the value and updates the counter. And that's that. Well, for me at least, and I think probably for a lot of people, when you see global variables like this, you think, ooh, you know? Like, there might be a good way, reason for this, it might be the best way to do it, but you should probably be skeptical, you know? Your spidey sense should be tingling. Um, so, and it's not that bad here, but you know, assuming this file goes on another, say, 2,000 lines, well, things can get kind of messy. So, what are some ways that we could clean that up? Well, the standard sort of object-oriented approach, which is, uh, right now I feel more mainstream than functional programming, is you still have all that state, but you encapsulate it. You quarantine it in some object, and then you only let certain bits of code touch that state. So in this case, we've got you know, a class uh, right here, and we have the value and the counter, and then we've got methods hanging off of it that does this. That, that does exactly what happened in the previous slide. It grabs a value, updates the counter, uh, or updates the value. And because, again, because this is now quarantined, um, if your code is clean, you're not uh, having other objects rely on the actual state inside of this object. Okay, so I want to give, uh, before introducing really the functional approach to this, I'd like to give a slight diversion that I feel kind of illustrates um, why the functional approach is better. And a kind of, 
in a kind of emotional, instinctive way. So again, you know, we've got this, func this code here that just uses these global variables, grabs the values, updates them, and so on. And you know, as we said, global variables like this make you feel a bit skeptical, a bit hesitant. Well, let's contrast this with this other piece of code. We've got a, a, a constant here, hello, and we use it in some bit of code. That's not as scary. In fact, even if this was hundreds of lines of code and uh, that all re referenced this constant, that's not really considered bad style. In fact, it might be good style. You've taken something that is uh, not changing in many places and put it into one place. And that's interesting because this is real, this is still some bit of global state, just like over here, but it's not as scary. And the reason for that is because that's a constant and this changes, which I feel like I've repeated myself there, but it's an, it's an important and subtle thing uh, because it's just easier to think about things that don't, don't change. So the core idea of functional programming is that all state is constant, it doesn't change. If you need to do something, you create new state that is just different from the old state. But that original state doesn't change, which is a, which is a different way of thinking about it. So here we've got a Python implementation of a functional approach to solving this. We've got a get value function, and it takes something. It takes a state variable, um, except it's not really a variable since it doesn't vary anymore. It's a constant. Um, and what it does is it returns the value, um, and then it constructs a new version of the state. So if you think of state as a two element uh, tuple, sort of like a, a list of things, then the first element is the value, and the second element is the counter. So get value just takes the state, returns the value, and then updates the counter. So it creates a new copy of the state without changing the original. Similarly, to update value, you just pass it a state and a new value, and it creates a new state. Now, you know, so you can see an example of how you use this. Just pass in 42.0, you get out the answer, and then an updated state. So um, pro that's sort of the, the core idea. It probably doesn't seem useful yet, but we'll get to that. And you know, we get some nice properties out of that. For instance, you know, we've got this old state, pass it in to get value, we get an answer and the new state. And you know, we can just like verify there are certain properties that hold true. The state is whatever was in the value, the new state is the value with an updated um, counter, and most importantly, most importantly, every time we call get value on the old state, it returns the same value. See, that's the important part right there. There's no global state that this function uh, depends on uh, it's just whatever is explicitly passed in, that's what the function depends on. But that's actually very useful, say, in, in uh, any kind of unit testing. Um, um, anybody who's done test, uh, any kind of automated testing of some method on some class has probably done a lot of setup for the state of the object before calling the method. And so you get these you know, pretty long, sometimes convoluted tests and whatnot. But if it's purely functional, it really is just a matter of, okay, for this set of inputs, does this function produce these outputs, which can lead to some, you know, pretty clean, succinct, uh, c uh, concise tests. Excuse me. So, all of this has been Python so far and no OCaml. So, now we actually throw in some OCaml. And, by do and we start by doing the same uh, example, but in, in OCaml. As you can see, it looks very similar. It's a very high-level language. Um, it's just very similar. Uh, so there are a couple things that make OCaml uh, nicer about this sort of thing. Uh, in OCaml, we pass in a tuple just like Python, but something neat that OCaml can do is what's called pattern matching, which means you can basically take apart the tuple, like this is one argument, but you take it apart in the actual definition of the function, so you can just pick apart the results very easily to construct your new, your new, uh, your new, your new, your new state. So. Um, yes. There's a bug here. This is not, this is not accurate. <sighs> oh well. So okay. This is just returning an updated version of the state. It should actually return the value right here, and then the updated version of the state. <sighs> of course. 
Okay, so this is a poor example, I apologize. I will fix this before putting the slides online. Okay, so now that, you know, I've talked a little bit about the functional approach, I wanna talk about some other features in the OCaml language um, that, um, that kind of play nicely with functional programming. So first of all, type inference, which I've already mentioned, algebraic data types, pattern matching, which we've already got kind of a hint at, kind of a, a taste of with taking apart that tuple in the function definition, uh, options, and then the bind operator. So first of all, you know, what are types really? Types are sort of like categories for your information, you know? You got the number 42, then in most languages that would be considered an integer. Got a list of characters, that's, that's a string. And you know, in m many languages you specify the types of your variables and the types that a function expects and returns uh, while you're writing the code. In some, fun in some languages you don't specify it, it figures it out while the code's running or you know, sometimes at compile time. So you know, an example of where this can be problematic is you know, C has static types. So in the C programming language, you define all these types. Okay, this, this bit of code, this function returns an integer, it multiplies it by two. Sorry, it accepts an integer, multiplies by two, and returns another integer. Uh, and when we try and call it with a string, well, the compiler catches this, says you're not supposed to do that. You can't, you can't multiply two times a bunch of letters. Which is very nice to have the compiler catch that for you, but again, you have to have the hassle of going through and manually specifying the types and whatnot. Now you can contrast that with Python, which um, does not require manual uh, specification of types, uh, and also does not catch it when you pass in something wrong. Your user kind of catches the error because two times this string in Python is that. And that's not actually what we wanted. So OCaml does something nifty, type inference, which is you define a function, f of x equals two times x, looks very Python-y, uh, and it works properly. You know, you pass in a three, you get out a six. But if you pass, you use a string, it throws a compiler error. So you get all the beauty of like the compiler uh, checking you and making sure you're not using things inconsistently without the hassle of actually telling it what you want to do. It's like magic. In fact, dark magic. So. Um, Actually, it's really something called the uh, henley milner type inference algorithm. And I don't actually understand anything about that. Um, but uh, it looks and sounds cool. And it's used in Haskell, it's used in ML and standard ML. Uh, and I assume, it, I assume it's in uh, F-sharp also. And that's really interesting because this magic actually goes back to the 70s. But it's only really now kind of starting to be played with in industry, which is interesting. So. All that's you know, kind of like high level stuff. I'm gonna try and give a somewhat more thought out co code example uh, by you know, building out a little tree-like library. Very small, very, probably very buggy. Uh, it can be improved in many ways, but it's, you know, it, sh it should serve our purposes. <coughs> so suppose you're wanting to build some sort of tree-like data structure. Every node has an integer, and it also has a name, an ID associated with it, a string. So the idea being that you've got this tree, hopefully, bi hopefully sorted properly, binary balanced, whatever, and you want to uh, find a particular node with a particular value, or sorry, find a particular node with that ID, and then pull out the value. That's sort of what we're going to work with here. Uh, now, a tree, you know, can be represent, a tree is really like one of three things. It's an empty node, so nothing there, an empty tree, a leaf, which has a name and the associated value, and a branch, which has a name, a value, and then left and right uh, subtrees. So this actually feels like a pretty classic example of what we might want to do with object orientation. So, you know, we might do something like this. We got a tree object, got some methods right here that gets values, gets names, and so on. Got a subclass of that, an empty tree, so it's a type of tree. Got a leaf, you know, type of tree, but with you know, name and value, and branch, type of tree, but with name, value, left tree and right tree. And you know, we can improve this implementation, but it, it catches the core idea. So um, how we would do this uh, in OCaml is a bit differently. We use algebraic data types. And so what we do is we define a new type, you know, so it's not just integers and strings or whatnot, it's our own new type. We, uh, it's exciting. 
uh, is a tree, and it can be one of three things. It can be an empty, or a leaf, which has a string and an integer, or a branch, which has string, integer, and subtrees. So then, to actually pull a value out of a given tree node, we, uh, we implement it like this, and we do something called a match, which is sort of a very pumped up version of a switch statement, which you might see in any like C-like language. So you know, we, pa we pass in to get value this tree, and then we compare it with each of these cases. Oh, is it empty? If so, return a default value. If it's a leaf, we pull out the value and return it. If it's a branch, pull out the value, return it. The underscores are a hint to the compiler that we don't care about what's there, so it won't give us a warning and say, hey, you didn't actually do anything with that. So it might jump out at you that a default value is kind of an ugly way of doing this, but we'll get to that later. The key idea here is just you pass in an object, or sorry, you pass in a, uh, a data structure, and you sort of pick it apart and do what you need to for the appropriate cases, which is, which is very similar in a lot of ways to object orientation. You know, you have different classes that are subclasses of one thing. In this case, you have different what are called type constructors for this single type. I have to say, I'm loving this green laser. I hope you all, all too. Um, so another related idea um, in OCaml, which, uh, which is shared with Haskell and other languages, is that the, uh, null may be a bad idea. So you know, in C, C++, all those languages, we have uh, null pointers. We have uh, a value for variables that indicate that there's nothing actually there. And you know, it has different names in different languages. Python has none, Ruby has nil, but it's the same underlying concept. It's a particular value that means nothing's there. So OCaml t does things slightly differently in that it has what's called an option. We're defining a new type here, just like we were with our tree. The little dash A here means, or quote A means that any type goes there. Um, so what that means is that an option is either none or some value where the value can be of any type. So for instance, you can do something like this. You can say nothing is none or something is sum 42. So what's that? Why do that? Well, we'll get to that, but first here's an example of how you might use it to clean up um, our get value function. Up here we were using, de uh, we had a default value which returns zero um, for the empty case, which, which is kind of, kind of ugly. Here, we instead, we just return num, none or some value for each of those cases. Now, the advantage of that is, when you think about it, get value is really, really returning two pieces of information. The first is, is there actually a value there at all? The second information is, if there's a value, what is it? So when we have some default value like this, uh, we're actually mixing those concepts up. So for the case where there might legitimately be a zero at some node, you can't really distinguish that. This, though, makes it more explicit of there was nothing there or there was some value. So that's actually um, an important thing in the language. We've got these two different pieces of information, the actual value and then the meta information of was there a value there at all. So it's very handy, it's very clean. Uh, and the compiler warns you when you ha don't handle both cases, which is pretty nice. I mean, how many, how many security vulnerabilities or crashes over the last 30 years would not have happened if a C compiler said, hey, you didn't make sure that wasn't null, you know? Quite, there'd be quite a, things would be in a much better place. So, um, yes. Now, a really cool thing is that because uh, this mechanism is actually used throughout the language, and so it has good support for it. For it and we can use it in some pretty nice ways. We can build pipelines of functions that get a value, if it's not none, does something with a value, if it is none, returns it, and just it, build a pi pipeline that only executes as long as it does not return none. So here's an example of, you know, and we're running lo low on time, so I'll kind of like skim some of this. Get value, returns none or some value, double, get double value, checks, and if it's none, returns none, if it's not, doubles it, get double value and add one, you know, gets a double value, if it's none, returns none, otherwise adds one to it. Okay, pretty straightforward, a lot of checking, make sure you don't trip over anything or forget any cases, but it's a lot of redundant boilerplate. But the language provides something called the bind operator that takes care of that boilerplate for you. So get value is unchanged, but we can, uh, our double value function here 
just uh, can assume that it gets an integer and then returns two uh, sum two times that value, similar to add one here. So then our get double value and add one is, can just be pipelined like this. So what bind basically does is whatever happens on the left side of the bind operator, if it's none, it immediately returns none. But if it's some value, it picks out the value and passes it to whatever's on the left side and then returns what happens there. So if you have a lot of binds, it kind of just goes through the pipeline until it hits a none and then aborts and returns none. So it lets you build pretty clean little pipelines of how to stack functions together. So that's all about the, lang the core language itself. I wanted to say a few words about the ecosystem. Um, you know, so nowadays you really want a package manager in your language. It's kind of hard to take it seriously if it's not there, you know? So, you know, Python has PyPy, Ruby has Gem, um, um, and so on. Well, eco, oh, and JavaScript has Node, of course, uh, Node Package Manager. So, OCam, oh, sorry, o OCaml has a package manager now called OPAM. It's a relatively new addition. Um, it has a standard, uh, OCaml has a built-in standard library that's very minimal, uh, but Jane Street Core has open-sourced a better, more feature-rich version of the standard library, and it's kind of just assumed that you use that anymore. Um, various things, when you install OCaml, you get two compilers for the price of one. You get, you get a bytecode compiler, which generates something that can run anywhere OCaml is installed, and an optimizing compiler that makes a platform-specific binary, which is faster. OPAM lets you install multiple versions of the compiler and libraries so that you can switch around and test if that's your thing. The community is kind of small, but is like growing, uh, and I kind of get the impression that it's kind of been asleep for the last few years, but is just waking up. Like there's some uh, new work going on in the compiler tool chain to make it faster, better support for threading, better performance, things like that. Uh, and there's various like cool things like Mirage Unikernels, which is something I'm not qualified to talk about since I, have, I know nothing about system administration, but it sounds very cool. So I'll leave you all to look it up if you're interested. Um, if you are intrigued where to learn, well, you know, the, uh, I started with this re excellent book called OCaml from the Very Beginning, um, which is available here, here or on Amazon. There's a real, an O'Reilly book afterward, afterward, Real World OCaml, freely available online. Just so you know, this assumes you've installed Jane Street Core, which it says in the preface, but if you don't read the pre preface like some people, myself included, you won't know that in none of the examples work. So, just so you know. Uh, it's pretty easy to install OPAM on, say, a Mac. Brew install OPAM, I think, and on Ubuntu, it's like app get install, and it comes with a compiler. Installing Jane Street Core is then OPAM install core. UTOP is a pretty cool we uh, REPL that you can then just jump into. Uh, and I ha have created my own website within the last 12 hours, which will eventually have more content about there, but is currently only hosting affiliate links. So uh, maybe in a few months it'll be interesting to go to. So um, there you go, that's how to jump in. And finally, looking back, you know, we touched on the features of OCaml. Um, you know, it's, I hope it's interesting and will help you learn more about it, make you interested to learn about it. Uh, apologies again for my emphasis on Python. And uh, since I've not made enough camel jokes in this talk, I thought I'd play this excellent video of someone tickling a camel. And the audio is probably not set up for that, is it? Still good? I'm not sure if the camel's actually happy about this, but uh, I would encourage everyone to just search for uh, camel laughing, and it's hilarious. And that's into my talk. Thank you, Josh. Anytime. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, so questions and answers, no, 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 you're not done, okay, cool. sorry. <laughs> um, what, what, why OCaml? Mm -hmm. So uh, I like just learning new things, and I played with Haskell a lot, and I like Haskell, but I was nervous about uh, two things. One, it has lazy evaluation, so you know, things aren't actually executed when you think they are, they're only executed when something that depends on that is, is needed. And two, uh, it takes the functional programming to the, the extreme, 
So all functions up here, including if, um, if you want to do some bit of I.O., read from the keyboard, print to the screen, it doesn't actually happen there, but the function returns sort of a recipe for doing that when it's needed. And so the function is still pure even when you're talking to the outside world. Uh, and that kind of, I'm not convinced that's good, but I'm open to the possibility that I'm wrong. I didn't think unit testing was good at one point. We all learn and grow. So OCaml is basically Haskell with strict evaluation instead of lazy. And it's, I'd say it's about 90% pure. So you can still go in and put in a print statement, which as I said is still my default debugging pattern. So it's basically Haskell without those features, which was the initial uh, goal of my talk, but that was way too ambitious. And then I have one more question and we'll uh, turn it over. Um, what's, what's the first thing you wanna do with it? Like when you, you feel like you've got a pretty good understanding, what, what's the, the thing you wanted to learn it for? Mm -hmm. So generally just like, I tinker a lot with side projects, really interested in like machine learning, artificial intelligence and stuff like that. So um, I, for about a year and a half I did a lot of tinkering in Lisp and then I decided to play with uh, Haskell and OCaml which in a lot of ways are like on the opposite spectrum in my opinion, but still cool. Uh, but uh, I'm actually, I'm really interested in something called uh, first order logic, which is a way of representing knowledge in a way that can be reasoned about with theorem provers. So I'm writing my own versions, which are probably not gonna perform well as the open source versions, but it's a lot of fun. And is very well suited for what it turns out. Cool, so any questions from the audience? Ian, hang on just a second. Brett's gonna bring you a mic so everyone on live stream can follow along. How have you found refactoring with OCaml uh, different than Python? Pretty good, so um, something I really love is that, so in Python, a lot of my tests end up being like integration tests just to make sure that all the pieces fit together and I didn't just forget that this function requires a slightly different type than it's being passed in, which doesn't show up in unit testing. In OCaml, like compiling is to a large extent integration testing. You know, a lot of things that, uh, mistakes I would have made in Python and not found out without explicit testing, the compiler just says, hey, you're passing in the wrong type here. So I find that ma to make it much easier to refactor because it catches my mistakes more quickly. And uh, I just feel like it makes it easier to thoroughly test. And test, good testing is, I, I feel, the, the basis of safe refactoring. Thanks. Huh? Anyone else? Are you allowed to uh, write imperative expressions like within functions and like you, you talked about Haskell, like evaluating those at some point in the future, like when it's actually uh, consumed or, or, or you know whatever they call it in the Haskell world. Um, like how, how, do they, how do they combat like side effects and uh, like maintain state immuta immutability if you're you know like you know writing just imperative uh, expressions like in functions? So like, um, so was that particularly about OCaml or Haskell? OCaml. Okay, so, um, so it, OCaml gives you the ability to do imperative stuff. Like you've got an array, you actually can change an element in that array, or you can, or you can uh, ha set up what's called a reference, I believe that's the term, which is basically sort of like a box around a value and you can change the value that the reference points to. So it, it, it allow, allows you to, to do assignment with slightly different syntax. Uh, at that point, it, you, I think you kind of just like accept the responsibility that it's not pure anymore, so there are side effects. Uh, and so it's what you do like when you just need like a little bit more performance or something. So what I, what I tend to do is I like to write my code so it's what I like to think of as globally pure but locally impure. So within a function, I might do a lot of state changes to say an array, but I do it on a copy of the array that's passed in. So that to anything outside of that function, it looks like it's still purely functional. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Does it only have access to its local scope? Like can it access, um, you know, scope from other, some other module that wasn't like passed in? You, yes, you can do that. You can, <coughs> it has the, uh, the equivalent of global variables. Um, so you can just define values like throughout the source file, or if they're referenced in other modules, you can access those directly. Or you can have like nested functions that then uh, have access to the th things defined in the enclosing scope. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, I, 
I really wanted to see the camel. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Josh. My pleasure. One more quick announcement. Um, I'm going to name a few people that a lot of you, uh, there's a lot of LPG folks here, so you kind of indirectly work with for Jack Studer, Shelly Provo, Prevost. Um, you, some of you work for startups that are funded by Chattanooga Renaissance Fund, which is David Blitz, Courtney Watson, um, Charlie Brock, Stephanie Crow. They're just, you know, general uh, good targets. Uh, if you haven't heard of Tech Goes Home, Tech Goes Home is a program that was started in Boston. We've been implementing it here in Chattanooga. The Enterprise Center has um, another team. I don't have much to do with it, but um, it basically, it, it's giving access to uh, digital literacy through uh, incentivizing training. So they take a, a kid um, that would need, uh, that, that doesn't have access to the internet and, and hasn't been, you know, kind of trained on how uh, these devices work, and they put them and a guardian through 14 hours of training. At the end of the training, they get the opportunity to buy an iPad or a Chrome, uh, Chromebook for 50 bucks. So it's a great program. Um, it's been funded by the city and, and the, and the uh, county governments, and, but, but it's, it does need more money. We're trying to hit 2,000 um, participants in the next year. So tonight at 5 p.m., there is a fundraiser, and it is a uh, Dunka VC. So all those people I listed are going to be uh, in a dunk tank, and I'm not sure what the cost per throw is, but I'm sure it's, it's well within the budget of having fun and dunking your boss. So, um, and and if, even if they're not your boss, you know, it's, it's still fun to go. But anyway, 5 p.m. tonight, it's at Miller. Um, ooh. You know what? This is a useless thing. It doesn't say where it's at. It says it's... It is at Miller Plaza. It doesn't say. It says... This is Chambliss Startup Show sold, but it doesn't say where this Chambliss Startup Social is. So I believe it is Miller Plaza. So anyway, quick, that was the last announcement, I think. Anything else, Brett? Uh, design or something. Okay. Chris <laughs> Keithley next week. Um, what else do you need to know? Talk. Yeah, it's Chris. Like, who doesn't test want to hear test for talk? security, test for design. There you go. Testing for design. That'll all be right. interesting. All right. Thanks, folks. Appreciate it so much. Sorry for all the rough edges on the production today. Um, I said it was going to be better. I didn't say it was better today, but it, it will be getting better. So appreciate everybody coming out.